over the last two years, I have lived in eight amazing luxury homes throughout Mexico, and I have paid nothing for that. Hey, Jen Max, you just met Lisa, and she is house sitting for my friends Jason and Debbie. We actually met at a restaurant a few months ago uh, when she was out to dinner with Jason and Debbie. And she's going to explain how she does this, how she rents houses like this one. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of a view here from their house, how she manages to stay in all these houses without having to pay a dime. She'll also share if this is the, the type of lifestyle that would work out for you. But let's hear a little bit of the background of how she got into this house sitting gig, and then we'll go into detail on who it's good for and any other questions that we may come up with in the next few minutes. I am a professional teacher by trade. I was living in Seattle and working at Seattle Children's Hospital for 17 years, I believe. I decided to quit and sell my house, sell my belongings, and I moved to Europe. Um, I taught English in Spain for roughly five years. Uh, that was in Madrid and Lyon, and I loved it. It was during the pandemic as well, so that was a little challenging. So then when I needed to leave Spain, I was looking at different places and where should I go next? Um, I didn't really have a desire to go back to the States at that time, and so I Previously had interviewed uh, one of my teachers for online that her and her husband did this. And so I put it in the back of my mind and when I needed to find a new location, I did research and I moved to Mexico and I've been house sitting for the last two years. So those of you that follow the channel know that Pat and I hire a caretaker for our home when we're not here. And we've never really thought about having house sitters stay at our place. So I want to kind of find out more about what house sitting is, what types of places, what types of people, things like that. Okay, so house sitting looks really different for many different people. So what it looks like for me, I, I go into houses, I take care of... Um, I, all of my sets have included animals, which I prefer. Um, and there are some sets that don't include animals. I have different responsibilities that I take care of. Uh, there's sometimes there's house management, there's staff management, there's obviously taking care of the pets, communication with the homeowners and such. So every house set looks a little different, um, but it all, for me, it all has involved animals. Okay, let's dig in here and, and use Jason's place as an example, because uh, I know that Lisa came in because I met her a few months ago uh, and kind of, you know, I guess that's maybe that's part of the process. Let's hear about this whole process and use Jason as an example. So one of my ways that I look for new clients is I will look at a map and determine some different areas that I would like to spend some time in. I like to slow travel. I like to be in a certain area for an extended period of time. Um, and so I saw La Paz and this area, and I've always loved Baja, and I wanted to spend some more time here. So what I do is I look at um, a community and I join different Facebook groups that have many um, people who potentially might need my services. And I connected with Jason and Debbie via one of my posts and we got to know each other. We do video chats and I always say, I need to be a good fit for you and you need to be a good fit for me. So it's, it's a mutual exchange. And so I was doing a sit in the winter in La Ventana and I had one or two days uh, la uh, lap that I could um, see La Paz and I met them and they, I stayed one night with them, got to know them and got to know their animals and they took me out to dinner that night and that's where I met you. <laughs> So let's go back maybe a couple of years when she was first starting this, because the process was a little bit different or when she was just starting. Um, it might be the way that you would want to start. But let's hear about starting versus now and uh, what's changed about her way of finding house sits. So when I first started, I did a ton of research because that's what I do. And I looked at different um, websites and platforms and I made a personal profile of why I would be a good fit. Um, so I, I made that. And then I also joined a, a house sitting uh, 
platform that is specifically for Mexico. I did that for one year and I believe it was around 60, 70, 80 dollars per year for that service. I'm not sure. Um, and then what I did is, like I said, I looked at a map and went before I had repeat clients, I would determine where I wanted to go. I joined different Facebook groups and put on my profile and everything about me, why they should um, contact me. And then thus I have met my clients. I have, I believe, eight or nine different clients. Many of them are repeats and my friends now. And um, so that's how I go about it. Now I have a schedule that I am booked through April of 20, no, not April, summer of 2025. And so I, take time off as I would like to um, and be able to travel and meet friends and visit family. So we are filming this in July 2024. So she's got about a year of bookings out into the future. But I want to hear about some of these bookings because Jason's house is amazing. And I want to hear if this is kind of typical for her is to stay in places like this or maybe places more like our house, which is a little just a bit more rustic, maybe. Okay, so I have stayed in a variety of houses. Many of them are luxury and amazing and houses that I would never be able to afford myself. Um, and so I think that one of my favorites, well, they're all my favorites, but uh, a beautiful house that I sit at is in Manzanillo. It's on the cliff. It has ocean view. It's about 8,000 square feet, indoor, outdoor living. Um, it has an apartment. Um, it has two jacuzzis and a pool. So these particular clients I've sat for, I don't even know how many times, maybe at least four or five times. And they are now my friends and I consider them my family as well. Um, and so that's just one example. They have an apartment that I can stay at that's on the premise that I can use uh, often. And they just came to my birthday celebration and they invited everybody and all my friends. So <laughs> they're probably going to have a lot more guests. So that's one example. I do have um, a client who lives a block from the beach um, in Puerto Vallarta, a, a block from the Malacan. So it's amazing. I can. It's an old town, so it's vibrant and fun and active. And it's just a fantastic location. That's a three bedroom, three bath with a pool as well. Another location that I sat at is in San Cristobal de las Casas. And this was a little on the on different. This person had a, rented a one room with within a complex and it was a walled uh, safe area. And it had a big garden and uh, I was there. I didn't know anything about San Cristobal de, de las Casas and I was there during the winter. And so it had a fireplace and it was amazing as well. So it was very much more like mountain rustic, um, but I, I loved it as well. So um, I've had a beach house uh, in La Ventana. It was it's in the it was in the um, cactus forest and it was amazing and I knew nothing about these huge cacti and you look out her window and you just see ginormous cactus and that was amazing as well and that was about a five minute walk to the beach in La Ventana. Um, and then I've been to San Miguel de Allende, which is a fantastic city. If you've never gone, please go. It's very artsy and vibrant and Spanish architecture and it's it's beautiful and that house I, it's probably similar to Jason and Debbie's it's amazing comfortable and cozy so those are just a few of my houses I've had one in Cabo as well I think that's it so so there are uh, a number of options if you own a home here in Mexico most people want to have someone in it this is actually Jason's place here is in a gated community, but it's also open to the desert around it. But it's good to have someone in your home. Some people will actually Airbnb out their home. So hire a management company to manage that and get their home out there on the market. I'm not a big fan of that because I just don't want to have like a bunch of random people coming through my home. And our home is is too unique for that. Probably true, too. People would be like, what is going on? What's with this house? Why are there geckos everywhere? But <laughs> Um, and of course, we have a caretaker. So there's different options there. So 
I want to hear a little bit if, if uh, Lisa can tell us a little bit of the opposite perspective of the homeowner perspective about having someone come to house sit for you. So I think that one of the benefits of having a house sitter like myself who comes in and um, basically lives at your uh, property would be obviously there's the caretaking of the pets. Many people might be traveling and where they're traveling, they're not able to take their pets with them or they are potentially older, so they can't necessarily travel like they used to be able to. And I think two animals just love their homes and they're comfortable there. And so there's many reasons uh, why people may leave their animals at their house. Also, I think having a person be in your home, there's a safety factor to that. There's, um, you know, people that know you, there's a person there. Um, to take care of any emergencies that may come up. There's obviously, there's going to be hurricane season coming. And so there's just, you know, emergency preparedness. If there's something happens and there's a, you know, a leak or whatever the case is, um, just to have eyes on the situation is really an important thing. Um, and then if you don't have animals and you have a person staying at your house, I think that there is just that communication aspect. So I communicate very regularly with my clients. Um, and so I think that you're able to communicate, send a WhatsApp and you get an immediate response. And So I always forget to ask you guys to subscribe. So I've thrown that here in the middle. If you're not already subscribed, please click that. It would be really helpful for me to grow this channel. And if you're on a TV, you can use this QR code over here and that'll help you subscribe. So yeah, let me just explain a little bit back to our situation is that we have a caretaker. He lives in our casita, which is separate from our house. And he actually leaves. He lives on the same street as us, just a few blocks down. He lives with his parents because that's very typical in Mexico. If you're not married, you live with your parents. And so it's really nice for me when I come down in the summer, I come down kind of randomly for a couple of weeks here and there. And it's nice that I just tell him, you know, get the house ready. So he gets everything all cleaned up and then he leaves. So I've got the whole thing to myself and that's not something you can necessarily do with a house sitter because they're kind of expecting that you're going to they're going to be there the whole time. And uh, Lisa was saying that there was, you know, some overlap with Jason and Debbie and she just stayed in her her room while there was that overlap and so everything works out well. It's a nice kind of transition. Uh, but it's it's slightly different than having a caretaker. And of course, we pay for a caretaker and it's possible to hire service. Your house can be vacant, but someone comes by and checks on it a couple times a week. That's a, a possibility too. Uh, it definitely, I like the idea of someone being in it at all times. So we pay our caretaker like $150 a month and he gets a place to stay and no utilities and internet and all that kind of thing. But let's hear more about the financial side of how things work on the house set. So I, this is an exchange. I, in exchange for taking care of the house and the animals and whatever we agree upon, I get to live in these beautiful, amazing places. Um, and so my expenses are very low. I spend money on food, fun, and travel. So to get from place to place. So I also have a 200 peso a month um, cell phone bill, which is roughly around ten dollars, ten U.S. dollars, and then I have Netflix. So those are all of my bills that I do um, have right now. I do not exchange money with my clients. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that um, when people come down, I, I'm not a resident. I'm working on residency status. However, um, it's not legal for me to take money when I'm in this country. And then there would be tax implications that I don't know anything about. So I, every client does a little bit something different. Uh, I have one client who takes me to Costco before she leaves. I have another client who they have an apartment in which I can stay at. Some clients give me, um, I have a driver in one particular area. Um, so if I ever need to go anywhere, I just call the driver and they take me places. So this sounds like the most ideal thing ever to me, but there has to be a catch, right? So what is the downside of being a house sitter? Financially, um, I think it's important if you choose to do this lifestyle that you always have a backup. Lucky enough to have savings and 401k and such that... Um, 
if an emergency were to happen, I can afford to do something else and pivot. So flexibility is really super important, I think. And um, it's, I do it, yes, to save money, but I also do it for the lifestyle. It's nomadic. Um, I get to see amazing places um, and I get to stay there for an extended period of time and do the slow travel. Another thing I think when people do this lifestyle, it's, it's, it can be isolating. I'm moving every anywhere from one, I, I tend to take long-term sets and meaning at least one month and then up to maybe three months. So it can be a little isolating and it's hard to develop friendships and relationships when you're always nomadic and moving. For instance, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, sit, uh, you know, emergencies happen and one client actually, they were scheduled to leave and uh, a couple of days before I was to get there, um, they had a fall and he separated his retina, I think is what happened. And so the doctor would not let him fly. And so that was the a month of April. And these particular clients, they're fantastic. And they said, you know, we have an apartment, come stay. You can come and go do whatever you need to do. We, st we, we know that you had planned to be here. So in that situation, I was out to no money and I, it was wonderful because I got to know them and I got to know their animals and their routines. Sometimes if that happens, you have a month that you have to figure out what to do. So you can do find an Airbnb, you can do a hostel, you can travel, whatever. Um, there's also a lot of communities within Mexico that people are looking for um, last minute sets. So sometimes there's sitter cancels or sometimes they have an emergency. And so being on some of those platforms that are looking for um, sitters and finding a last minute set would be also an option. Let's dig in now to who makes a good house sitter and maybe who makes not a good house sitter. I think some of the qualities of to be a good house sitter and to enjoy it, uh, you need to be flexible first and foremost. Um, and you have to be adaptable. So everybody has their own routines. Animals have their own routines. And so it's really important to be able to adapt to whatever lifestyle that you're going into. I think you need to be communicative. Uh, pet owner, you know, house owners and pet owners, these are their babies and it's, it's hard for them to leave. And so it's really important to communicate as much as they are asking you to. So sometimes I communicate multiple times a day and I send photos or sometimes it's not as much dependent upon my client. You need to be organized and clean. I think basically you're going into somebody else's house and space and they're, this, is, this is everything that they have and to be respectful of their um, environment is really important. Um, and I would say to Obviously, if you are going to be taking care of animals, that is an animal lover. And, you know, I was a teacher for so many years and all my love went into my students. And then when I stopped teaching, I, I now realize that all my love is now going to my animals. And so they're like my babies. And one of the other hardest things about this is saying goodbye. So I have these really strong bonds with these animals, or I think I do anyway. And so this, the process of saying goodbye is very hard. I can totally understand the animal part. It's always because we do a lot of fostering and it's always so sad to let the animals move on to their forever life. But um, actually on this trip down to Mexico, I got to see Sweet Pea, who is now Pia. Uh, Gaji and Paul are her new family. So it's also great to every once in a while reconnect with those animals. So let's look at the, the houses or the places that Lisa's been sitting and like maybe what's a good sit, what's a bad sit? I have been so lucky. I can honestly say I have had no bad sits. And you know, that's probably unusual. Some people do in, uh, experience some difficult sits. Um, you know, when you do this lifestyle, it's it takes a special person. And so I know other people that do this house, uh, this house sitting and pet sitting and this lifestyle. And so I have friends amongst, you know, within Mexico and other places that do this. So we exchange stories and such. So my house sets have all been fantastic. And 
one of the things that I do is I do video chats and I vet these people. So I go on my gut. And so if it doesn't feel right, if there's something that's off, I, I, I decline or I do not accept a set. So that's really super important to trust your gut and to see, to see them and to see their environment because I, I like clean places and environments. And an example of that would be one of my friends that did a set, not certain if they knew uh, if they did a video chat or not, but when they got there, it was not clean. Um, and that was very challenging. Um, and so there's been examples of that. Also, I think just the how homeowners portray their pets is another thing to keep in mind. Um, so always ask questions if the animals are reactive, if they're if they're used to being off leash on leash and how how they're how they go about their days with their animals, because I think sometimes um, just like parents, but animal owners have a different perspective of their animals than the general population may. Um, and so, you know, if if you have experience in training or boarding or reactive dogs, so there's sometimes reactive dogs and some I have one which I love her and she is pit and she is so strong. She's 80 pounds of muscle, I, I think maybe 70, but she is super strong. So you have to be strong, you have to be in shape, you have to be able to manage these dogs. Um, and so that's important as well. And I have a couple other friends here. I just missed them on this trip, Mar Ray and Marion. Uh, they do house sitting. I actually did a video with Ray. It'll be up in one of these corners. And if I don't put it there, remember, like, tell me down in the comments. I, I always forget. But um, they have been house sitting. They house sit all around the world. And they do this as a couple. Uh, they were also teachers, interestingly. Uh, and when they retired, they were like, let's go around the world house sitting. So let's hear about, is this a couples thing, singles thing? What is What do relationships look like? <laughs> So I obviously do this solo um, and I know that other homeowners have had friends that do it together. Um, so if you are, for instance, a teacher and you want to come with a friend, you can totally do that as well during the summer and breaks and such. Um, and then uh, partners. So um, whatever that partnership looks like. So there's oftentimes two people. And I think you know, dependent upon the responsibilities at the house and with the animals, two people often probably would be better than one. Um, and I make sure not to take, agree to a set that I think would be too much work or, or a lot of responsibility that I couldn't handle just by myself. Um, and I think to developing relationships um, is one of the challenges because I am nomadic and I may be somewhere for a month up to three months. And when you meet people and they know that, oh, you're leaving in a few months, that can be a challenge as well. So, however, I do my repeat. So I've developed friendships for sure in different areas. And so it's really great when I go back to other areas and I get to see the same people. And yeah, when Lisa mentioned the summer thing for teachers, uh, a lot of people in Mexico, especially down here, uh, as hurricane season is coming and it's getting really hot, a lot of people down here do want to go vacation somewhere. Even if this is their permanent home and they're full-timers, they are ready to get out for a couple months. So this might be a really great way for uh, folks to establish a vacation and even maybe a repeated vacation every year. But let's flip from vacation to work because this also seems like a great thing for someone who's a digital nomad and has another stream of income. This would be a way to reduce your costs even more while you're still making money. So let's talk about that. Okay, so I do a few things. Um, I still teach online and I tutor some uh, adults who live in Spain when I was there. Um, and so I have four adults that I work with on a weekly basis. I also am a style on demand. Um, I'm starting a business in which uh, people contact me for different designs and we 
work on it with print on demand. And so, for instance, I have a few teacher friends out there, many teacher friends. And so we are going to do some uh, group type of uh, gifts and such. And so you we do that. And the last thing I'm doing is I actually have a rough draft of a book that um, I've started. I get so many questions about my lifestyle and how did I make it happen. And so it's in the it's in the editing stages right now. And so that's going to be an ebook that's coming out soon to teach people how to do this and maybe even a um, teach myself how to do an online course as well. But that's down the road. So that's, cool. that's how I make some money and to live the lifestyle that I do. The book is new to me. So once that happens, you'll find a link down below so that you can pick that up and learn more about how to do this yourself. Because it sounds like Lisa is really living a dream here. Yes, there is some responsibility and some scheduling attached to it. But what I mean, these the houses that you stayed in sound amazing. Is this a possible way for you to make your dream work? I've got another video I mentioned, Ray and Marianne, that's up here so that you can learn about their journey down here. And then a whole bunch more videos down here from other expats that have made the dream happen. So follow in their footsteps. Hasta luego.